Hey guys, welcome to the Massive Iron Channel. I'm Steve Sean. This video, we're going to talk about the almost, and we got air quotes on almost because we don't want to trigger anyone. The almost complete guide to building a workout, how to fit everything in. Before we get into this topic, if you have any questions or comments, drop them down below. The best topic ideas I turn into videos just like this. All right, I'm joined by Faz, Faz Lips. You can see his his name in the, oops, wrong way, his name in that box right there. Uh, Faz, where can they find you on Instagram on, and on the YouTube? All right, folks. Yeah, look for me on Instagram at Faz Lifts, YouTube at Faz Lifts, also my podcast as well, everywhere which hosts podcasts. So we're going to do a, a topic I don't think I've ever done, and I don't see, you know, in the, in the sea of the biggest chess building mistakes and videos like that, uh, we don't see too many uh, guides on how to build a workout. So let me set the table with the the concept, okay? You have your four, basically four major, and we're using this loosely, right? Um, because getting into a semantics discussion, what's a major body, minor body part is silly, but conventional weightlifting, uh, conventional muscle building, the four major body parts are back, quads, chest, and shoulders and then if you're if you're building a workout you got your four major body parts and then you have rear delts calves abs forearm neck traps glutes lower back biceps triceps hammies did i miss anything fast i think you got them all yeah so you got all of those you yeah. got all these body parts and all of a sudden you're staring at a three-day full body template mm -hmm. Um, say an upper lower where you do every other day, three days a week or four days a week, or even a body part split. The question is, how do I fit all of this stuff into a program and still have it well-rounded, have it complete? Mm -hmm. So Faz, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to set the table with how I kind of think, and then I'm going to pass it over to you. And I don't mean to dominate the conversation opening up, but me personally, and this is just how I program, I usually start with about four exercises uh, for the major body parts, generally around four, and this could, it could, of, of three sets, so about 12 sets, sometimes it's 10. So you have back, chest, shoulders, and quads, that's about 48 sets. Now, if you were to add all the uh, other body parts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and let's say you wanted to give them six sets a piece. That's 66 sets. Mm. So you have 66 sets of minor body parts and 48 sets of major body parts. That's 114 hard sets a week in a full body. You're looking at 35 sets a day. If you do all of that, even in a body part split, you're looking at well over 25 sets a day. So the question is, Faz, and I'm going to pass it over to you. How do you process this and how do you fit this into a workout and what do you cut off? Okay. So, yeah. So when I start putting together the routines, I, I look at things slightly differently than Steve, I think, but um, fairly, fairly similar. So I kind of split it up into chest, back, quads, and then hamstrings, glutes. So upper body, two big body parts, lower body, two big body parts. Then on top of that, um, I look at delts buys, tries, calves, abs, and that's kind of like the, the, the setup. So if we're looking at, say, a, an upper lower, which is a pretty common split for a lot of people, so upper lower split, I might have um, chest back, delts, arms on the upper, um, quads, hams, calf, abs on the lower, so it's a nice sort of split, even split. I think that works pretty well, but then you've got to really bear in mind, okay, how many sets do I want per body part per session? Now, at a certain point, <clears throat> the time is going to overflow and what we want to do is we want to look at where can we save time and i think that's kind of part of the conversation today isn't it steve so like right. how how exactly can we program everything in making sure we're covering everything but we're not getting our clients to spend all day in the gym and so i think probably the very first part of the conversation we need to talk about is is it worth specifically programming in a lot of the isolation lifts like um isolating specific forearm work or neck work or trap work or glute work. 
And uh, we talked a little, a little bit off air about that. What are your thoughts on that, Steve? Well, first off, I want to say, um, you know, these are the types of discussions when we see things slightly differently that people will come to us and say, Baz said, Steve said, <laughs> right. And, right, and try There's to a lot of that. <laughs> it, it's just we have two different languages, but at the end of the day, the application yeah. is going to be fairly similar. So mm -hmm. I, I want to set the table with that yeah. um, because that's that's usually how these types of discussions go. Yeah. Um, if I'm looking at four days a week, I'm looking mm -hmm. at logistically 72 sets uh, tops, mm -hmm. uh, like tops, like absolute tops, 18 yeah. a day. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I tackle the big stuff first, you know, whatever you want to define as the big stuff for that particular client. Um, you know, some clients are very glute focused and you got to add a glute exercise in. Um, so I start there, but once you have that in place, then you have all these minor uh, areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and Faz, we talked about um, before we jumped in, you know, based on the program for that particular client or that particular person, you know, and how it's impacting muscle groups using the major lifts, what yeah. then do we need to fill in first? Now, I'm going to shoot some body parts at you and you can let me know your thoughts. But Obviously, biceps, triceps, and hammies, you got to have work in there, right? Number one, if you don't, uh, someone's going to have a heart attack. Number two, I think there's a, uh, in my experience, when I cut out biceps and triceps work, things like my bench eccentrics uh, felt yeah. noticeably heavier. My yeah. arm size decreased, and there's some scientific information that shows that that's beneficial. So would you agree that, you know, once we got our big stuff in place, you have to put in some bicep, tricep, and hammy work. Yeah, definitely. So I think this is where we can say, with a lot of the big exercises in place, in place, they probably cover a lot of work with, say, forearms. Maybe you could argue traps. Depending on how heavy you're going, you can maybe even argue abs. So there's quite a lot that gets covered with the big exercises. You get, I think, in terms of ab work, for example. I mean, Steve, um, you're probably quite similar to me. When we were in our powerlifting heydays so back in the day, right. um, I didn't really do a great deal of ab work because I was just under the bar so much anyway. So the very small muscle groups, like you're saying, I think they get covered just from the big compounds. Now, where it becomes a little bit trickier, and I think this is a big meaty part of the discussion, is how much carryover do we actually get on the medium-sized body parts, like, say, the buys, the tries, stuff like that. And I think that's where I think I kind of want to introduce the concept of um, fractional sets and um, the individual var air variance in fractional sets. So let's say, for example, the example you and I were talking about off air was um, pull-ups. Now, the pull-ups also involve, involve biceps or even weighted chins. But can we say one hard set of weighted chins is a set for biceps? I would say for me, probably not. Um, so you can't kind of as one set for biceps but there's certainly something for the biceps so i think that's where we have a bit of a discussion going about okay how can we um individualize that and i've got a couple of examples that i uh, i've used in the past which i can share with the audience so i'll start off with just one as a client i had a couple of years back um gemma and uh, i had her like you do with every client you set them up with you know a routine to begin with to just see how they respond now by the end of the first block with her her elbow was starting to be a, little bit, be a little bit overworked. So we had a look at her routine, had a look at her form, and she was a very tricep dominant presser. So on machine exercises or bench presses, she was very tricep dominant. She wasn't really chest dominant at all. So what is the solution in that circumstance? Well, for her, the pressing, the chest pressing, would involve a lot of triceps. So alongside the additional tricep work I had with her, the isolation exercises, she was getting way too much tricep work. So simple solution, what do you do? Well you've got two options. You can either cut back on the chest pressing or you can cut back on the, on the tricep work. What we thought we'd do is a bit of a compromise. Rather than cut back on the specific isolation work, we replaced some of the chest pressing with chest isolation work. So it took her triceps out of it for, that, for, that, for those number of sets. She still got all the right chest work in and all of a sudden her tricep and her elbow feels a lot better. So that was a way of individualizing the set volume because for her, 
the triceps got a lot of work whenever she's pressing. So I think with the concept of fractional sets, I think you've got to look at yourself as an individual and think to myself, think to yourself, um, how much am I getting in terms of contribution on the smaller body parts with this big isolation? Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, you call it fractional sets. And basically, I tend to dumb it down even more, you know, into just rants, like you don't need neck training and forearm training. Um, but it's, it's the same concept. Now, uh, what you talked about, um, you know, pull-ups, I, you know, everyone's into, uh, individual. When I do the dumbbell rows, like I like to do, they're very taxing for me. Hmm. And uh, it's a lift I'm naturally strong at. Um, you know, I've done 200 by 22, 270 by 10. And, uh, you know, I feel my bias, the limiter on those is usually my cardiovascular system mm. and my biceps. I have to be very, even if I have spot on damn perfect form, there's, you're going to start to feel some bicep fatigue. So, uh, for me, um, even on a lift like that, the, with the biceps being, um, you know, a small week exercise, I'm, I'm going to notice them. I'm going to notice them being worked. Um, to your point, you know, I have naturally big triceps. So um, I focus on a lot of chest work in my training because chest is always overshadowed by my triceps. And I do certain even pressing exercises like a guillotine press variation where I can really feel my chest stretch. And uh, I don't want anybody to panic. I don't take the barbell down in my neck, but it, it's a variation. So with that established, Faz, um, mm -hmm. we got kind of, you know, the big hitters in the mix. Yeah. I want to I want to go over, uh, you know, continue this discussion on fractional sets. Mm -hmm. And let's talk body part by body part really quickly in a machine gun manner. Uh, I'll give you my take on uh, rear delts first. Uh, mm -hmm. When people want rear delt training, the first and foremost, uh, I tell them to get your rows strong, get your rows in place. Um, you know, a, a face pull isn't too far off from a row. So my my baseline for them is to have them get their row strong. Let's focus on your rows. And then if you want to add, a, it's, it's hard not to add a set of face pulls in in this day and age because people panic like my posture and like rows are kind of doing the same thing. But what are your thoughts on rear delts? That's my standard. You know, get, let's get in a lot of quality row volume, pull volume, and then maybe a trivial three sets of face pulls a week. Yes, but I'll, I'll take it back to the example you gave about the dumbbell rows um, and, and also the example I gave about the chest press with my, my female client. Um, I think it really depends on the execution of your rows. So for, uh, for, this, for this girl I was coaching, um, the execution of her chest presses was very tricep dominant. So I think one of the things I like to do, and I know you're very big on this as well, Steve, rightfully so, is form checks for clients. And I, I want to make sure when a client is rowing, they are actually getting the most out of the row. So they're using a right. full range of motion, rowing all the way. And they're not just doing this, this sort of short range lat row. Because I think rows are a back exercise. They're not just a lat exercise. So I'm not a big fan of trying to target specific areas of the back when doing rows. I want to just row for overall growth because right. it gives spillover onto the smaller body parts like the rear delts so and that and that i will say that's regardless of if the client's got lots of time to train or or is limited on time to train so now with that i'm going to say like yourself steve i probably wouldn't eliminate rear delt work specifically altogether unless the client was very limited for time and then i might opt to do a lot of compound lifts um there's usually room to add in a few sets of rear delts my preferred rear delt move for my clients is dumbbell rear delts or some sort of chest supported rear delt move like a barbell face pull. Um, so you're lying on the bench and your chest is supported. I find, and not to maybe get too much hate on me from your from your channel, depending on how many athlete next viewers we've got on here, I find the face pull to be a movement which is good for people who are weak because you, if you're standing upright, you're limited by your own body weight. Otherwise you'll just pull yourself towards the, the cable machine right. i find when i'm doing it, i have to maybe put a foot up and just put my foot against the machine to prevent me from pulling myself towards the machine because after a while you get 
to a certain level of strength and it becomes pointless. So it's not a movement if you are decently strong, in my opinion, which makes it not a very good movement for the long term, because if we're thinking we want to add weight and be progressively loading the movement over time and over the course of years, it's not a movement that I program a lot in because I would rather have somebody lying face down on an incline bench and pulling up with a barbell so they can actually load that movement over time. So the take home, I guess, here would be get in your rows and mm. then uh, probably I would say both of us program in a minimal starting point. Like if you're at home and building mm. your own program and not sure yet, maybe uh, start with a minimal amount of rear delt work, get to know what's going on. Mm. And uh, look, I'm going to, you know, when it comes to your rows, like Fast said, let's not try to turn everything into this slow mind muscle dance where you're your dumbbell rowing 45 pounds and trying to feel your lats, um, get them strong, you know, strong. with, with yeah, good get them strong. Mm, yeah. One thing, one thing that's super popular over here in the UK, Steve, I don't know about you, but I find it infuriating myself is when you get beginners, guys who are 160 pounds and they do that one arm cable pull down <laughs> Right. to the to the low lat i'm thinking hold on you are not 260 pounds and you don't need to isolate your lats you need to spend that 10 minutes doing some rows which is going to grow your entire back it, it just makes makes no sense to me so yeah completely agree train your whole back so let's jump into something that's a little bit more easier i'm going to lump these two together because um you know let me first we're, we're going to talk neck and forearms here let me first mm. Uh, preface this by saying, um, you know, it's going to get some alpha destiny comments. Uh, uh, I get along great with him. He, yeah. He's like, uh, I would, uh, has a, I would, I would not hesitate to say he's kind of like a, a son, you know, he's like a, a little me. I appreciate his hard work, but he does contribute a lot uh, in this industry to forearm and neck training. Now, I've been around the block many, many times around some of the strongest bodybuilders and power lifters in the world at infinitum, you know, YouTube celebrities. I see a lot of huge necks and I see a lot of huge forearms and these guys are not really training them directly at all. It just happens as you get big. I will say, Faz, I'm not a fan of training either of them, programming either of them in. If you want to do some wrist rollers or some forearm work at the end, there's no downside. I just don't believe there's no value um, in general in spending time on these. And I will also say that if you have a 150 to 175-pound guy or woman, whatever the case is, that has yet to establish the ability to build muscle, yet they want to add in forearm and neck work, the amount of progressive overload that it's going to take, it's going to be a four to five year journey. You're going to have to invest all that time in there. And then at the end of the day, you're probably going to just have the same size you would without it. So Faz, what are your thoughts on uh, adding in neck and forearm work? Yeah, I think firstly, just on, uh, on on Alex, like we're both big fans of his. Uh, I really like his material. I know you, sp you have a good relationship with him. So yeah, absolutely no no disrespect to Alex at all. But I, I generally don't program in um, forearm work uh, or neck work specifically, unless specifically asked to. And then I might add some in. In general, I think there are better ways to spend your time if you're interested in over all over growth. Um, yeah, that that's my perspective on that. I, I, I can't say it's something which warrants, in my experience, seems to warrant a lot of work. So Faz, I'm going to jump on quickly so we don't turn this into a, a, you know, a full three-hour Batman movie. Um, lower back. Um, you know, my thoughts on lower back, occasionally someone will want a lower back movement. I might toss it in just to throw them a bone, but I will not program that indirectly because I believe, from my experience as a coach, uh, getting squats in place, getting deadlifts in place, and then if we have an RDL uh, or even a stiff leg deadlift, um, yeah. there's a lot of direct pressure on the lower back. And until we get form down, I do not believe uh, we need lower back work. Now, let me throw in a caveat. If you're a rank beginner, um, then doing some lower back work before your squats and deadlifts get super intense I would be okay with that. Um, 
but I just like if you're if you're someone that's building a program and you're 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 pretty hard into the squat and deadlift world already, I can't see backtracking and adding in lower back work. What is it? What's your thoughts, fam? Yeah, I guess this is where my low back, the work, low back work that I program tends to come alongside the hamstrings and glutes. So um, I see the lower body as two major body parts being the quads and then the hams glutes. And if then essentially the lower back kind of gets trained in with those. So I typically have around about four exercises for that whole area. It'll usually be two hip hinges and two types of leg curls. Obviously leg curls aren't really affecting the lower back very much at all, but they'll be getting a couple of hip hinges in there, which are going to train the lower back. And some of my favorites are the Romanian deadlift and the good morning. Big fan of both of those. I generally have people good morning after they squat and generally have people doing deadlifts after they leg press on a separate day. That's my rough kind of setup, which a lot of my clients will be familiar with. So in terms of like specifically isolating the lower back with additional work, I find that that pretty much covers it because it gets trained alongside hamstring work at about half the volume of hamstring work. You add in some of the carryover effects that they're going to get from squats and also some heavier back work and like upper back work, and I think they're pretty covered. Yeah. Yeah, and let's not forget, uh, this is an important point that I want to bring in because you mentioned back work. Um, back work can be very punishing on the lower back, like upper back work. Mm. Dumbbell rows, barbell rows, T-bar yeah. rows. Um, you know, and a lot of times we have to, I have to remove one of those exercises for a specific client to help relieve some pressure on their lower back. So. Mm. Um, just keep that in mind as well. Your lower back is getting hammered from, from, uh, you know, many exercises. I will also say Faz, this is a phenomenon and I want to touch on this real quick. Um, when someone is, has good form and they're doing everything right, they're consistent and they're bringing up their squats and deadlift. Uh, in my experience at some point, it becomes noticeable for the lower back to be the very weak muscle in the mix because they're squatting, they're deadlifting, their form is good, their quads are getting stronger, their upper back is getting stronger, the big muscle groups, the glutes, the hams are getting stronger, and the lower back kind of lags a little bit, uh, in my experience. And they'll reach a point if they're doing things correctly where they almost start to pick up lower back stress just as part of the process hmm. uh, is that something you've experienced or any thoughts on that yeah 100 percent, definitely i think that mirrors what, what i've seen as well my my rough broad sort of perspective on this is um going from sort of a beginner level to advanced let's say a beginner might train it's a, if they're on an upper lower routine they might train some variation of a squat and deadlift twice a week because it's acceptable to do that now as i get my guys to progress what i generally do is I'll have a squat and good morning on one day and then a deadlift and leg press on the other. Now, when my clients get very, very advanced, then it's a case of the first day will probably be a squat and deadlift variation, maybe alternating uh, on a sort of a conjugate style thing. And then the second day will be just completely isolate, um, completely um, var uh, variation work, uh, a lighter variation work. So it ends up over the course of a lifetime, if people followed what I said there, over the course of a lifetime, I'm looking at moderating the amount of stress that the lower back gets by switching around the order and the frequency of the squats and deadlifts. So initially, training them both on two days of the week, then later on, splitting them up, and then a lot later on, making sure you're only going heavy once a week, otherwise the lower back is just gonna take a hammering. And on the second lower body day, more than likely do a combination of lighter variants, which are easier on the system, maybe some speed work, stuff like that. All right, Faz, let's move along and touch on glutes. Uh, glutes are all the rage. Uh, you know, one of the, the big body parts, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure you get folks come to you that want to do glute work. And I really don't want to add in glute work. And I don't add in glute work. Like, here's a scenario. Someone wants to add in glute work, so they'll see an exercise uh, online that they think works the glutes. And then they want to add in like hip hinges or pull throughs or something mm -hmm. they think, you know, kickbacks or mm -hmm. something they think works the glutes effectively. Um, now, I will, somebody posted on Instagram uh, a, a power lifter, and I'm not going to name his name, basically saying if you want big glutes, squat. Mm 
and I couldn't disagree more. Uh, I squatted for 37 years and I have pancake ass. Uh, it's just the way I'm built. My glutes don't yeah. grow from squats. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think you should have squats in the mix. I think you should have some other leg exercises in the mix, maybe leg press or hacks. Mm. Um, I like to include lunges for my clients. Mm. And, uh, you know, RDLs are a glute uh, exercise they involve the glutes. And I think from there, um, we would kind of assess whether someone needs a glute exercise. I don't generally program them in. So, Faz, what are your thoughts? And what are your thoughts on, like, big exercises that people love to add in these days, like a hip hinge for glutes? I think this goes back to what you and I were saying at the beginning. I think we have to individualize. And something you said just now, it was the same experience for me. I did squats for for decades. And um, I never got any massive amount of glute development from them. I got a very, very good quads um, and a good back, but that's about it. So... Yeah, I think I think you've got to base it on the individual for sure. I will also say, uh, when I was in stage shape, um, I had good glutes; they were striated, and it, you know they they were full. So it's not like I ever needed specific glute work. They seemed to be good enough as they were. So I think we've got to base it on the individual. Every now and again, it's usually my female fitness or bikini competitors who will want to do specific glute work. So what I do then is I base the program around glute work. And we might end up doing glute work three times a week as often as that. Um, but in general, it's a case of, it's two factors, the way I see it, if we, and this expands away from glute work, expands it to everything really. One is how much carryover are we actually getting from the compounds that we're doing with the goal being to get bigger and better at these compounds? Um, and do we need additional work? And the second thing is how much of a focus is it actually for the client? Because I'm a big believer that in terms of how we create our routines, I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, Steve, um, we have to balance it between what the client's actual priority is versus what we feel they need at that stage of development. So let me explain what I mean by that. So like, let's say they're an intermediate, an early intermediate. We know full well that they'll be better off growing the whole body. But let's say they want to specialize on the shoulders. Okay. I might bias the program a little bit towards the shoulders, but I'm still going to get them to grow all over. And it's the same thing with glutes. I think if somebody has real interest in glutes, I'm going to take that seriously because that's their request. However, I'm still going to try and bias them towards whole body growth if they're in the stage where that's appropriate because I'm the coach and I know that they'll be better off with doing that. But I don't want to ignore their personal preference completely. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's 100 percent the you know the truth. You, if a client has, or when I say a client, any of you watching, if you want to specialize in one area, like. Yeah. You want to do forearm work or, or whatever, or glute work, that's fine. Um, but, you know, the, the point of this video is what do you prioritize? What should you get in first if you want a good balanced body? And, um, you know, we're that's why we're kind of combing through things. Get all the stuff out of the way that you, you don't have to fit everything in. And then you can start adding pieces in where you have time or energy or interest. You know, I'm just going to go off on a bit of a rant here, Steve, in terms this is, um, and I, I'd, lo I'd love to get your opinion on this. So this is part of one of my issues with when um, coaches on Instagram really advertise their services to say, we are going to do a personalized program. And based on everything that you and I have said in terms of how we coach, how, apart from just small things like how many days a week do you train, how much time do you have to train, all that kind of stuff, um, you only can only really personalize once you've worked with someone for a while. Like the examples you and I have given, you know, right. once like that, that lady, that lady Gemma that I was, that I was coaching, it was only after six weeks that I could really tell, okay, there was a volume imbalance in terms of how our training went. And then I could personalize. And I think there's two things. One, I think it's personalization is sold as this um, thing you can offer right from the beginning, but you can't offer full personalization from the beginning because you have to actually work with someone for a while right. and i suspect that the coaches who don't know that are the ones who aren't like you and me and are actually evaluating the client as they go along because i do a lot of that i work in blocks and every six weeks we're going to do an evaluation we're going to see okay what has happened and the same things you were talking about with your dumbbell rows we want to see all that and see how the person is responding where they're lacking in muscle groups and i think this spans across everything we've talked about over the last half an hour is you've got to evaluate your client and if you're a, a somebody working with yourself you've got to evaluate your own progress and think okay i'm doing all these compound exercises 
where am I lacking? And then add work in there because like Steve and I both have agreed, we didn't get much glute work from squats. So we had to, if we wanted extra glutes, we'd have to add something in. So I think you've got to really be on the evaluation of your work and your physique and what it's giving you and then make changes according to that. There is no cookie cutter prescription. And like with two good coaches here, you're not going to find a cookie cutter prescription at all. No, personal, like I talk about uh, one of my pillars of success is evolution of training. And that's basically what we're talking about, self-evolution or evolution from a coach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's as simple as I'm doing barbell rows. I hate six rep sets. I'm going to do eight. I really enjoy those. Why? Who cares? Yeah. Um, right? Um, like uh, when I screen a client, What's their, here's the personalization. What equipment do they have access to? Right. What's their injury history? Yeah. And what exercises do they really not like to do? Like, yeah. I hate, I hate, and it doesn't matter why, I hate front squats. I just hate front squats. I hate them, I hate them, I hate them. Um, I don't, I've done them plenty of times over the years, but if a client has an exercise they can't do or don't like pull-ups or they hate front squats, we throw those out and we find, but once you have that starting point, uh, and this isn't just about our clients, this is about you guys. You have that starting point. You throw out the exercises you hate. Mm -hmm. yep. You plug in the exercises you can do because of your equipment and your injury history, and that's your your starting point. That's your Absolutely. foundation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> and then with, with the combination of sort of video check-ins and feedback and having a look at what's growing, what's not, you can really get to, and also just a feel of the session. This is something that people hate talking about these days, but, um, and I don't know if this is going off on, on one, but what about the pump? What about the soreness? Are you getting a good pump in certain muscle groups that you want to, or you want to grow? Are you getting soreness? Uh, and I know that's a bit more of an edgy topic, but I think these are all factors which, which come into play when you're trying to determine whether that compound is really hitting an individual body part. But, you know, the point stands, I think you've got to be individualized. You've got to personalize, but after a few weeks. One of the things I do with my clients, and this is something you guys can do to yourself, is when you're done with a workout, say, how did that feel? How right. well, how did that exercise feel? Mm, yeah. um, I'm always asking my, you know, my, my clients will post a workout and I'll be like, I'll, I'll, I'll pick through it like a bird, you know, a little bit every, you know, different time. Like, how did rear delts feel? Did you, were you able to feel your, uh, yeah. your, you know? And they might be like, all he does is ask me how I feel, right? <laughs> it's a therapy <laughs> session. Pull, yeah, we're trying to pull things out of you. All right. Um, let's go on to the last three calves, abs, and traps. Now, mm, yeah. traps I program in mm -hmm. um, because I have a bias. I love trap work. Mm -hmm. I believe that a strong yoke traps uh, – will only help with a deadlift. So if you are strong and holding weight, it'll help you a little bit when you're trying to <clears throat> pull weight off the ground. I think traps um, are undertrained by so many people mm. uh, in the sense that they, they'll they either do mind muscly stuff getting or no time under tension. Now let's be careful using time under tension because I, I don't usually use that word but Faz, the traps have a limited range of motion, a limited amount of time uh, that you're working. So if you just do a, a three set uh, a set of eight, it's done in like 12 seconds. So yeah. I like yeah. to do things that encourage cumulative stress. Like mm. I have a, a five plus five uh, plan where we set the timer for 120 seconds and we do five shrugs and then we hold for five seconds and then we, just things to beat the living yeah. crap out of your trap. So I like the program in traps, mm. but that's a little bit of bias. One last word, you're getting in trap work on your overhead press generally mm. to some mm. degree, mm -hmm. um, you know, and deadlifts are obviously working your traps to some degree. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on adding in trap work? So I do trap work um, in, in a way which is a little bit unusual, but um it points to how I set up routine. So, you know, as I said previously, I view the lower body as being quad and hams as the main muscle groups. Now, in my experience, most people don't need as much hamstring work as they do quad work. It seems to be about two thirds on average anyway, it varies. So what I do is to even out the programs, I take a little bit of trap work and I add it in instead of some hamstring glute work. 
and that seems to even things out. So I actually train traps on lower body days, which I find works quite well. So I get a bit of upper back work on pretty much every day if I'm training, you know, upper lower across the week. It seems to work out quite well. And sometimes I might not even do actual shrugs. I might do, again, a, a sort of a high row variation on the lower body days. So with some of my programs, I'm getting people working the upper back all four days of the week if they're doing upper lower. So I do like some trap work. Um, for the powerlifter types, I don't program in as quite as much because they're usually deadlifting quite a lot. Um, and I guess that's, I think this is one of those areas, Steve, where coaches do have a bias. I think you find coaches who program in quite a lot of deadlift work tend to not program in quite as much trap work. Coaches who don't program in quite a lot of deadlift work tend to focus on trap work, which I think is perfectly normal and acceptable because like we have based this entire discussion of, you're filling in gaps based on the compounds that you have available. So I think it's fine. But yeah, that's my the, approach. One of the sneaky things I used to do to, to work in traps without having to load another barbell, like you remember Jamie Lewis, you know, he... Uh, yeah, yeah. Pain, uh, chaos and Pain? Yeah, Chaos and yeah. Pain, uh, yeah. the king of 800, 700-pound shrugs, right? Yeah. Um, one thing I always did in over the years was like on the last set of RDLs at, at mm -hmm. lockout, I would just shrugs. knock out a max rep set of shrugs yeah. or yeah. my last deadlift set, I would do a static hold and shrugs. Yeah. I like to sneak things in like that on traps. Those Romanian deadlifts with shrugs at the end, they will get you something nasty sore. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an easy way to work it work in traps all right abs and calves let's go to before we have and mm. end on abs calves um okay when i build a program sometimes at the end i'll put calves optional right because look i made a post on instagram the other day how many people do you know that train ab or calves with the intensity that they deserve to actually mm. grow i leave them off the table uh, and if somebody's passionate about them, I, I completely am good with you adding them in. But if you're going to do them, we have to do them correctly and with the right degree of intensity. What are your thoughts on calves? So I work with a lot of um, sort of mostly hypertrophy bodybuilding type of clients. Um, with them, I generally program calves and abs in because I think aesthetically it's quite important. However, um, I do use a lot of intensity techniques to make sure we get in and out quite quickly. So my reps, um, short rest periods, drop sets, things like that. So I find cable crunch is my favorite premier ab exercise, you know, just overhead cable crunch. And I find if you can program in something like three to four sets with only 20 to 30 seconds rest in between, it's challenging. So people get up for it because ab work is generally not that challenging, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's interesting you're using weight, you can progressively load it, but the entire three to five sets is done within about three minutes. That is the kind of tactic that I take. When it comes to calf work, if I can, I'll fit it in in between people's leg presses. So they'll do a set of leg press and then they'll do calves on the leg press. They'll do a hack squat and they'll do calves on the hack squat, stuff like that. So like you do with traps, I kind of sneak them in, but I think aesthetically they're quite important, but then I do work with a lot of bodybuilders, either competitive bodybuilders or wannabe bodybuilders. So I think from that angle, it, they're, they're a lot more visually striking than forearms, for example. Um, so I like to add them in. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you want to, I'll just end with abs and then we'll do a quick recap yeah. and get out of here. My, my, uh, you know, when it comes to training abs, I really try to avoid any of the, you know, common bull crap, you know, the repetitive stuff. Yeah. Um, can you do an ab wheel rollout for three sets of 15, uh, you know, like planks, uh, uh do you have bl basic plank skills? Now plank is boring. So I'll do things like shoulder tap planks where you're counting reps to stay engaged or rotational planks where you're doing, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. That's kind of where I'll start with people, mm -hmm. ab wheel rollouts and some kind of a rolling or a repetitious plank. And then after that, if they want ab work, we'll we'll figure we'll figure it in. I don't generally program in specific ab work, but I will say abs or calves optional. I must say. So fast. Just as a final note, this video we're going to do a quick recap and get out of here. This video is about building your own workout. Now, yep. I'm going to take a minute and tell folks how I do mine. You're going to recap, take a minute, tell folks how you do yours. We have established all the body parts that are kind of optional, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, we've established, we've had some good conversation on different body parts. For me, um, you know, I look at back, I look at quads, mm -hmm. I look at um, shoulders and <laughs> my <laughs> and chest. My brain's frying here. Shoulders and chest, uh, back and quads. Those are the big ones I start with, the must-haves. Then I add in some bicep work, some tricep work, some hammy work. And from there, I might pepper in three sets of rear delts, three, uh, some kind of trap protocol, and optional abs and calves. After that, you have a full schedule already, uh, especially if you're doing a full body. But four days a week, that's a pretty tight schedule. And then from there, if you have something pet you want worked in, then it's time to work it in. So, Faz, uh, you got a minute. Tell us uh, you're, you're quick and dirty. Okay. So advice for you guys if you're building your own program is I the way that I do it is is I'll start with chest, back, quads, hams, glutes as the four major body parts. Now, if I'm doing that on a full body, they'll all be right up there as the first four exercises you do with something representing them all. If you're doing it as an upper lower, it'll be chest back one day, quads, hams the next day. Then I fill in on the upper body with delts, bias tries, and generally calves and abs. For me, that balances out quite nicely. Now, in addition to that, I very rarely program in specific forearm work or specific neck work. But I think if you have time to do those and you are interested in doing them, it's not a bad idea. However, I would like to see you and I funnel the volume to where it's useful. And um, I did a video on this recently. You can check it out on my channel, which is just trying to make your training as specific as possible and ensuring that the bulk of your training is going towards hypertrophy of the areas you want to uh, grow with the type of rep range and exercises which are best for growth. So we all have limited amounts of time in the gym. I think you should just funnel the majority of your training effort into the areas where you're covering a lot of work and then specifically individualize how much additional work you need. I, for example, just a quick one before I end, I don't personally do as much tricep work as I do bicep work because I get a ton of triceps from any press that I do. It's just my personal preference. Uh, but you might be different and you should be aware of that and program accordingly. To be fair, just like most coaches do, most good coaches should be working with a client and be looking at these types of trends. Hopefully that helped. Definitely helps. You know, I just noticed I have the black background. You have the white background. We have the angel and the devil. Right. Somehow I got pitted to be the devil. <laughs> uh, one final parting shot of uh, Faz is like when people look at our different approaches, hmm. um, you know, and people do that, like Faz says this, Steve says that. What you need to see is the commonalities, you know, the, the commonalities, like, Usually the differences are just nuanced and not game breakers. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to game breaking or breaking a program, um, you know, there are based on everything you've learned in this video. Now you should be able to go over and look at someone's program. Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to name names, but I got a, a newsletter from uh, someone and it com was completely unbalanced. And it had all the things in the workout that people, you know, like that's overstuffed with abs, that's overstuffed with glutes. Mm. You should be able to start to see, um, you know, when somebody doesn't understand programming based on some of the things we've talked about in this video. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys, I took up Faz's entire morning. You're off to do a workout and I'm off to hit client work. I appreciate you joining me, Faz. Everybody can find Faz on Fazlifts on YouTube or on Instagram at Fazlifts. So, guys, hope this video has been of some help. If you have any questions, I can't end a video without this, Faz. So if you have any questions or comments, drop them down below. The best topic ideas I turn into videos just like this and something stuff, stuff, stuff. Thanks for watching. <laughs> have a great day. See you, Faz.